Good evening, everybody. And may I start, first of all, by acknowledging the presence of my founding president, the founding president of, Seych of Seychelles, Sir James Mangan. It is a great honor that I can speak today as the foreign minister. He was our president at independence. So the fact that I am here as a, a young politician speaks volumes about uh, the progress our country has made and also where we are going. I'd also like to say uh, good evening and uh, thank you to all the ministers here and the distinguished guests. And it's a great honor for me to speak just after a colleague from uh, Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone, of course, is West Africa. We are East Africa. Uh, but we are always sitting next to each other at the UN because of the magic of the alphabet. Because Sierra Leone is just after Seychelles. So we are neighbors, at least in the alphabet. So my uh, remarks today will be about nation branding in small islands, about turning globalization into an opportunity. In a recent informal conversation with a fellow foreign minister from a European country, we suggested that we should aim to meet in a more structured bilateral setting to further enhance the relations between the two countries, possibly through a visit. So I suggested to my colleague, to my colleague minister, that he visit Seychelles for these discussions. He immediately jumped up and told me, you'd better come to Europe because my constituents will assume I'm going on holiday if I say I'm going to Seychelles. So Seychelles has immediate brand recognition. Our islands are more often the subject of whispers on the lips of honeymooners rather than the subject of serious international diplomacy. And tourism being the main pillar of our economy, there are obvious advantages to such associations. Our marketing can benefit from the assumptions that many people have about our islands. But the key question is how do we mobilize this ideal into a positive development force. In many countries around the world, we know that wealth and economic growth do not always correspond to development. Development does not just happen. It is not automatic. And in the context of small islands, there are a number of challenges which arise from the small size of the economy, the size of the population, the lack of economies of scale, and a number of others. And globalization has brought about new and even more complex challenges. For small island developing states such as Seychelles, it is clear that we, that we have to develop a brand which is more than just sun, sea, and sand. Our tourism board has been making great strides to diversify what we offer in, in terms of tourism. But in our discussion today, I would like to also state that we must view the Seychelles brand in a wider context beyond tourism. As the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Seychelles, I will invite you to look at Seychelles, a Seychelles brand which encapsulates our foreign policy, aspirations, and our positioning in a globalized economy and a multipolar world. In this global economy, our brand must be able to bring all the positive energy generated by the beauty of our islands together with the drive towards development. It is easy to conjure up ideas of idyllic paradises when talking about islands such as the Seychelles, and it is equally easy to dismiss such islands as being inconsequential in the realm of international politics. So we did have some beautiful images uh, here. I'm essentially telling you we are more than this. Many small island developing states, SIDS, these are what we, this is what we are called, we face a development paradox. The small size of our populations means that development gains are quickly translated into real benefits for ordinary people. In Seychelles, for example, it is estimated that at independence, over 50% of the population may have been illiterate. While with the institution of universal primary education in the 1980s, literacy has risen to 96% in 2010. Seychelles has consistent, consistently pursued people-centered development policies. We have universal access to primary education and a minimum of 10 years of free schooling. We also offer free health services to our population. And we are classified by UNDP as one of the 50 countries in the world with high human development. We have 89,000 citizens only, so we are very tiny, but with a GDP per capita, which is one of the highest in Africa. But we are still a developing country with a number of challenges. In small countries such as ours, 
transformative development can happen quickly and effectively, provided, of course, the good governance framework is in place. The trickle-down benefits of traditional development can be accelerated in small islands. The concept of transformative development is one where countries can rapidly bring real gains to their populations and empower their people. Unfortunately, very little existing aid mechanisms are truly transformative. For example, we have humanitarian assistance dealing with disasters, but do they really allow development in the long term? But small islands, in many cases, can give quick indications of how development mechanisms can be effective, or also when they are not so effective. We are the best barometers for development. But the existing international development architecture poses many problems for SIDS. SIDS are the success stories of development, but how do we sustain this success? We can achieve positive change quicker than most, but we are also often the most vulnerable economies. We develop quicker, but we can also lose what we have gained just as quickly. The established norms of international development divide the world into development categories. The countries deemed to have the, most, to have the least positive perspectives for developments and most in need of development aid are termed least development countries or LDCs. These countries are entitled to special attention in the context of development, rightly so, because as a community of states, we must strive to improve the welfare of mankind and not of any individual state. However, it is important that we do not lose sight of the object of development. That is to empower people to rise above poverty and become productive citizens of our planet. Since the creation of the LDC category in 1971, only three countries have actually graduated from LDC status. Botswana in 1994, Cape Verde in 2007, and Maldives in 2011. You will note that two out of those three countries are small island developing states. In addition, all of the likely candidates for graduation in the future are SIDS. The list includes Samoa, Vanuatu, Tuvalu, Kiribati, and the Solomon Islands. There is a resistance towards graduation, which is understandable, because graduation from LDC status means loss of many development benefits, including grant aid and concessional credit. So graduation for most small islands means entering a development no man's land. In this development gap, SIDS are deemed too rich to continue to benefit from development assistance and too poor to truly get the advantages that go with having the status of a large developed economy such as preferential trade deals or credit on advantageous terms. Many people have attributed the success of SIDS to sound development policies, both in terms of development programs and the policies of the islands themselves. But this is only part of the story. Sound governance is a prerequisite for development. Without strong institutions that can ensure transparency and accountability, development is delayed. For Seychelles, this is part of our brand. We take government commitments very seriously, not because we have to prove anything, but because good governance is one of the tools that facilitates our development. Because of our commitment to good governance, stability is also part of our brand. And the same applies to many small islands. And the success of small islands in, this, in these uh, instances leads to many calls that the already stretched resources available for international development be concentrated elsewhere. But while the success of SIDS does highlight many best practices, it also highlights the failures of existing development structures. The fact that only graduates from LDC status since such categories have been in usage are islands and countries with low populations shows that the international community is not investing sustainably. The experiences of SIDS highlights that there is a sustainability gap in international development. How do we ensure that development is a continuous process? There should not be an end to development. It cannot be a point at which it ends. Seychelles has called for the creation of a SIDS development category because we believe that we must create better conditions for development, not only for our own people, but for the world. SIDS are currently marginalized in the current development architecture, and there are many warning signs 
that we must heed to ensure that we can truly address the development needs of the world effectively. I speak of the development needs of the world because Ireland's experience do illustrate where we'll go wrong in the future if we do not address the current problems. Firstly, a large number of small islands are highly indebted. Many are facing debts to GDP ratios in excess of 100%. This means they owe more money, more, they owe more than their capacity to produce. To list a few examples of 2010 figures, Antigua and Barbuda, their GDP to uh, GDP uh, percentage, the GDP to, to debt uh, ratio is 130%. Uh, Barbados is 100%. Grenada, 110%. Jamaica, 125%. St. Kitts and Nevis, 185%. Seychelles had a debt to GDP ratio of over 160% in 2008. But we have successfully renegotiated and rescheduled our debt to reduce it to 80% of GDP as of the beginning of this year. But the problem is not going away because since small islands more and more have to turn to commercial credit to fund development. And it is important to rationalize the international credit system when viewing the predicament of small island states. For example, if one of the largest emerging economies, one of the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, if they go to an international lending institution, there will be no shortage of lenders queuing up to offer the lowest rate possible just to make sure they get the contract. If a small island tries to borrow money to build infrastructure, potential lenders will factor in it's a small economy, there's no natural resources, the high vulnerability to external shocks, and the interest rate that will be applied will reflect those considerations. Credit becomes very expensive. Secondly, SIDS are highly sensitive to fluctuations in the world economy. The financial crisis hits islands uh, hardest as the first areas of the world economy affected are often tourism and financial services. These are one of the few competitive advantages that SIDS have. Thirdly, SIDS are the first to fall off the world development radar. In the 2010 Human Development Report, new methodologies have been applied to the compilation of statistics, and new software was used, where in many instances the models used do not cater for countries with populations of less than 100,000. The new methodology meant that 14 states were not ranked in this latest report. And of the 14 unranked countries, Seychelles included, 10 of them are islands. We are the world's barometers. But if we cannot measure our progress, this has repercussions on development as a whole. If we can't measure the smallest, we can't say that we're measuring the largest effectively. And in the context of the existing development architecture, islands have a del delicate balancing act in terms of their positioning, in terms of their branding. Their relative development success is something which is, does not allow them a certain space in the international arena to have their voice heard. While at the same time, they have to plead for special consideration for their circumstances. In terms of, Seychelles, of how Seychelles projects its foreign policy, we often find ourselves having to aggressively promote our successes, while at the same time sending a plea for, here, for help. These contradictions are embedded in the international system in which we operate, and also in the inherent vulnerabilities that island economies have. Our efforts at nation branding through our foreign policy seek to go beyond this dichotomy. We have called for a special development category for small islands, not because we feel that islands should have preferential treatment, but because a truly sustainable world economy depends on a new approach towards development. Categories are a reality of the existing development architecture, and they reflect the fact that there is a big gap between the need for development financing and the availability of these resources. A special category for, for small islands will not be a call for additional resources. On the contrary, it is a means to rationalize many development efforts. Islands allow development to be assessed in terms of results much quicker than in many other economies. Lessons can be learned and programs adapted. There are real possibilities to test the true sustainable development uh, the true to test true sustainable development programs. The world needs transformative development, and not just trickles of wealth 
that reach certain populations temporarily. Many things that can be done in small islands to foster development, uh, many things that can be done in small islands to fo foster development models that can be replicated, replicated elsewhere and with minimal cost. Allow me to refer to some examples relating to Seychelles. Firstly, Seychelles has recently signed a contract to connect its first undersea fiber optic cable to the African mainland. This project is a game changer because it will reduce the cost of communications seven times. The financing of such a project would have seemed impossible for a small island state under the traditional development scenarios. But by putting together a public-private partnership and also getting the startup support of the European Investment Bank, we have been able to get the project off the ground. The EIB have participated in the project by providing credit at very reasonable rates and also by providing a grant as the equity for the project to be launched. This is the first time ever that the EIB has ever used such mechanisms for such projects. Without such support, the project would never have happened. But through this minimal investment, the project, has been the, the project that has been developed does not only have benefits for Seychelles, but for all business and services that would use communication services in the region. Another example which we started in the late 1990s relates to a groundbreaking project that our national petroleum company, SAPEC, has undertaken with the assistance of German expertise and also German credit. SAPEC currently operates a fleet of state-of-the-art double-hull tankers that ply the oceans of the world delivering oil and oil-based products. We also operate one coastal tanker within our waters serving the islands of our archipelago. The project was possible through an affordable loan from KFW Bank in Germany, which allowed the vessels to be built at a very competitive cost at Lindenau shipyards in Kiel. For the two examples above to succeed, depended on Seychelles and its partners going beyond tried and tested frameworks. It involved finding innovative solutions going off the beaten path. For all developing countries to be able to meet the challenge of sustainability, we have to adopt innovative approaches. The two experiences I've illustrated above could be replicated through development frameworks and it will generate a return. It will help to make small and vulnerable economies more sustainable. It will also improve the overall context for development in the world. Most existing forms of development financing are reactive to the forces of globalization. We need to be proactive. We need to turn globalization into an opportunity rather than a challenge. And we must adjust the international framework to make such possibilities the norm of international development rather than exceptions to the rule. You are seeing some images of our islands. I could have started the lecture by giving you a list of facts about our islands, that we are an archipelago of 115 islands spread over an expanse of 1.3 million square kilometers of ocean. But I want us to look at that as you are seeing, but also beyond that. In our discussion today, I would like us to view Seychelles from a development perspective. And I would like to take a few moments to describe to you some of the measures taken by Seychelles since 2008 to sustain its development and ensure that we are beneficiaries and not victims of globalization. In November 2008, Seychelles was facing economic meltdown as the food and fuel crisis was taking its toll. Our large debts at that time meant we could not just borrow our way out of the crisis. How did we get into this position in the first place, you may ask? At the end of the Cold War, Seychelles' geostrategic position in the Indian Ocean was no longer leverage enough for grant assistance from major donors. At the same time, there was an increased need to continue building on the development gains of the 1980s and build more schools, hospitals, diversify the economy. The only route for this was to take on increasing amounts of commercial debt. As the debt increased, our foreign exchange situation worsened. And by 2008, Seychelles was firmly stuck in what we call a debt trap. We realized we needed to fundamentally reposition ourselves in view of what was happening in the world. We approached the IMF and the timing for the discussions was perfect because the IMF wanted to prove that they could deliver more user-friendly programs Seychelles wanted to prove that our economy was viable. The program we implemented flo floated our national currency and started a process of renegotiating our debt with partners with the support of the IMF and the Paris Club. 
One of the fundamental starting points of our program was the need to maintain our gains in health and education, and spending these two sectors was maintained despite the reform. The government also set up a strong safety net for those most vulnerable through the creation of the Social Welfare Agency. Within a year, positive results were being registered, including stabilization of the exchange rate. And Seychelles has emerged at the end of 2010 with an impressive growth rate of over 6%. And our economy's prospects are very bright due to the continued FDI inflows, but also a vibrant domestic economy fueled by small and medium enterprises. But we do not take this success for granted. Success Seychelles successfully weathered the storm, largely in part because we embraced the changes we had to make from the start. We did not approach the reforms as something imposed on us, but as something which we had to tackle as the next stage of our development. We promoted a national brand based on three R's, realism, responsibility, resilience. And we succeeded because this brand created confidence both among our domestic population and among our international partners. We were determined not to be victims and rather adapt, survive, and thrive. Seychelles is the smallest state in Africa. Our links to the continent are both historical and also there are emotional links. And there are many faces of Africa in the world, but most do not reflect the true vibrancy of uh, what is going on in Africa. They do, not uh, they do not reflect the possibilities of the continental brand, our African brand. The World, the world Cup has shown what we can do but it is often the exception rather than the rule. But we are the continent of growth and of opportunity. So we must find new and innovative ways to convey to the world what every African already knows, that the African sun is rising and is bringing a new wave of prosperity to its shores. There are several measures we must take. The first is that we must be more united and speak more openly against those who seek to act with impunity on our continent. Africa has fought against the specter of colonialism for many decades. We owe it to those who struggled for freedom to uphold the values of liberty, equality, and justice, which will also set the path for our development. We must also be more forceful in conveying the true potential of Africa in our own terms, and not those set by the same preoccupations that are used to convey negative images of the continent. We have many good things to say, and we must not be afraid to say them. We must use the increased moves for regional integration to fast track our development. Seychelles, as one of the smallest co uh, countries in Africa, is proud to be associated with these developments. In most indexes that assess governance in the African region, the island nations tend to score consistently high. Seychelles, Mauritius, Cape Verde, and Sao Tome and Principe are always listed among the 10 best governed countries in Africa. All of these economies depend on tourism. In Seychelles, we see tourism as a means by which we mobilize positive effects of our tourism brand towards development gains. There is also a huge potential for a regional dimension to such efforts. Seychelles is already promoting what we have termed two center holidays where tourists are offered a package which includes a few days on the beach in Seychelles and a few days on safari or similar adventure-based holidays on the African mainland. For example, we're already doing this with Kenya and with South Africa. The formula is creating a new level of interest and offers true win-win partnerships between the island economies and mainland economies. Through such initiatives, we're also creating another facet for a brand for Africa. Seychelles has re recently organized its first international carnival, which also featured the participation of a number of African countries. We had over 30 international media organizations covering the event, offering a new window for African culture and for tourism on the continent. As far as we are aware, we are the only international carnival in the world. That is, that is to say a carnival, which is not only a showcase of our culture, but also offers a platform for the display and promotion of partner countries. In our carnival, we had Zimbabwe, we had South Africa, we had uh, the Notting Hill Carnival in, uh, in, from the UK. We had a number of countries participating. 
through such events, we are building a brand for Seychelles, which is dynamic and open to the world, but we are also contributing to a positive African brand, which is open to the world. Both are critically important as we continue to na navigate the channels of globalization. We must also be looking in terms of brands at opportunities for Seychelles and for Africa. In terms of development, one of the biggest threats to Seychelles, but also to, to all islands, and also African economies, is that of climate change. It is clear that the world response to climate change is still too slow and still relatively ineffective, despite relative progress in Cancun in November. Amidst the challenges of adaptation to climate change, renewable energy offers a real development opportunity, both for Seychelles and for Africa. Small islands such as Seychelles, but also African countries, have huge potential in relation to their potential of harnessing renewable energy. A carbon-free Seychelles, a carbon-free Africa, has huge brand potential. It is important that we spare no effort to identify development financing that can allow appropriate technology to be invested in Africa. We need to look at innovative financing models that are economically sustainable. In the case of small islands, in particular African islands, we have the very real opportunity to develop truly carbon-free economies. The key element to kickstart such projects is the ability to transfer appropriate and adaptive technology. Regrettably, much of the renewable technology still remains prohibitive in terms of, of the cost for developing nations. This is why we need to be innovative. Renewable energy adds another string to our bow, both in terms of our African brand and our Seychelles brand. This is a key deliverable in terms, of, in terms of turning globalization into an opportunity for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, small islands often have to shout to be heard, if they are heard at all. Recent crises have, all, have further emphasized their vulnerabilities. But we are not afraid to shout. We are not even embarrassed to scream. We have something worthwhile to say. We can offer ideas. We can offer inspiration. Small islands often have to act like they are bigger than they really are. My founding president says, in fact, we are not small because we do not think of ourselves as small. Our national brand is a tool that we must use to be able to accelerate our own development. What is our brand? It is more than the idyllic paradise that you see in the glossy brochures. It is a vision of a small nation which wants to make a difference in the conduct of international relations. It is a vision of a nation which believes strongly that the framework for development needs to be improved. It is a vision of, a, of innovation which can improve not only our, our development perspectives, but the, also those of our region. It is a vision of a proud culture that is determined to turn globalization into an opportunity. We are small, but we will not accept to be victims of global forces. No country on its own can ever claim to change the world. But we are determined to play our part. But we also need the world to come together and relook at development. And we thank you, all of you here today, for your support. It has been a great pleasure to speak at the ICD which is a forum which really allows these ideas to be shared, which is part of creating a better world and a better framework for development. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much, uh, the Honorable John Paul Adam. I think we already have the first question in the second row. So, is that right? Yes? OK, all right. Sir James Mancham. Well, Minister, I'd like to congratulate you rather than make bother you with questions. Okay. I think you did a very good uh, dissertation of our situation. Thank you. And congratulations. And, uh, Please come more often to the ICB. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So please, questions or comments? And if you could please introduce yourself and stand up also, that would be great. Thanks. My name is Alicia. Uh, I'm a student of Spain. 
And I would like to say in my name and in the name of all my uh, fellow students, my companions, that we are all very impressed with your speech and that um, the part that I most liked was when you said that you wouldn't be, wouldn't be dragged by global forces. That, is, that has been so very, very encouraging. And my question is referred to aid. Um, do you re receive like bilateral aid of governments like um, tide aid where other governments ask you for like interest or something like that? Or do you re receive more uh, multilateral aid? There is less tight aid and it's like more altruistic. Thank you. Thank you for uh, an excellent question. Uh, I should say gracias, but that's the extent of my Spanish, so I won't go any further. Um, the, the question of, of aid is one very interesting in the context of Seychelles because we are classified as a middle income country. Um, what that means is that in terms of most bilateral uh, programs for aid, we are not eligible. So, for example, uh, the French government, the German government, the uh, UK government, or many other countries, they will not give us bilateral assistance uh, linked to conditionalities, as you say, uh, because as you know, some countries will say, we will give you some aid if you support us on another project. We do not get this because our level of, of development is considered to be higher and therefore, we are not considered priorities. So and at the same time, as I've said, we don't actually want this because we don't think necessarily that's what exactly what we need to develop. What we do need, however, is a better framework for the development. And that is to say, if you're, if you're a smaller country or uh, a developing country, if you want to fund your development, um, you need to have the startup. You need to be able to get, uh, get people interested in the first place. And sometimes that is where it's difficult. Because a big, uh, a big country, let's say like China, if they want to start a new telephone network, you will already have 10 companies lining up with the capital to start it. Whereas in a smaller country like Seychelles, the startup has to come from the government. Why? Because the, the, the market itself, although it can be interesting in the long term, it's not a quick uh, return on your investment. So what we are trying to tell partners is, look, look at Seychelles as a long term investment where we can get something started. So we don't get aid tied to uh, conditionalities like uh, uh, you were saying. We do have some multilateral uh, programs. Uh, one thing that I did not talk about in my speech, maybe a bit on purpose, is the subject of piracy. Uh, piracy off the coast of Somalia is something which is affecting us a lot. So we are getting some funding assistance at the moment, but linked specifically to piracy. Because Seychelles is one of the countries most affected by, by piracy. Uh, we, have, we are getting a grant of 3 million euros from the European Union, and that is designed because we are spending over 2.3 million euros per year in extra costs to patrol our waters because of the, the, the threat of piracy. So the 3 million euros from the European Union, it's over three years. It doesn't actually cover our full costs, but it's, it's a recognition that Seychelles is part of the international effort to combat piracy. Uh, we're also getting some other supports from the European Union in those terms, in terms of defending our waters. We have 1.3 million square kilometers of ocean. That means the amount, again, we are not a small state when you look at the ocean. 1.3 million square kilometers means that our ocean is equal to three times the size of South Africa, which is one of the largest countries in Africa. So we are small, but we are also big. And this has its own challenges. So again, to go back to the, the, the aid aspect, we are, it is an advantage in a way that we are not tied to any of this uh, aid aspect. On the other hand, we are in a position where if we really want to develop some infrastructure and our brand has to be in, in Seychelles, about, it's about the beauty. But be, with the beauty, you have to have the efficiency. You have to have the, the fast telecommunications. You have to have the fast internet. You have to have all of these things. To be able to develop them, you need the startup funding to get them started. And this is where there is a big gap at the moment in the world. And our argument is also saying that even countries that are less developed, they will also eventually face the same problem. And we have to relook at the concept of development, take it away from the kind of conditionality aid, and look rather at really empowering projects that allow uh, countries to invest in things that become more productive in the long term. Sorry, my answer was very long. 
Okay, I see we have a few other questions. I'm not sure who is next. Uh, okay, we'll go here and then. Okay. Uh, I have to say that uh, it was a very nice presentation. I would like to go to Seychelles. But uh, the question is uh, um, uh, such, uh, how, how are you going uh, to solve your uh, debt? How are you going to pay your debt? Thank you. Uh, very good question. Um, what, what we did in terms of the, the debt was much of the debt that we accumulated was also debt that was accumulated during the Cold War. Uh, during the Cold War, we were receiving, to go back to the previous question, we were receiving certain aid which was related to will you support us in the UN or will you not? Uh, and a lot of this debt uh, was, was there. A lot of this debt had no interest on it until the fall of the Berlin Wall. Then once the Cold War entered, ended, the geostrategic aspects, meaning that it didn't matter whether we supported them anymore, in the context of international. So suddenly, these loads started accumulating interest, and we didn't have the capacity to pay them. So when we went to renegotiate the loans in 2008, this was recognized in the bilateral debts that we had with many countries. So many countries, uh, such as Germany, in fact, but also uh, the United Kingdom and France, they actually wrote off a good portion of our debt. So um, when we went for the renegotiation, they canceled a part of it, and the remainder was rescheduled over a longer period. So although our debt to GDP is quite high now, it's 80%, it is still relatively low because it is spread over a period of up to 20 years. So we have a longer period to pay back in, and it is also, our debt has been uh, restructured. The amount of forgiveness that we asked was linked to the productive aspect of our economy. So what we are currently, we have 6% growth this year, and as long as we have over 1.5% growth, average over the next 15 years, uh, we will be able to service our debt. But that's the, the question is a very good one, and it goes back to some of the central points I was trying to make, that price of oil now is $110, I think, uh, a barrel. This can have a huge impact on our economy, and, so, and it can make our economy unviable if it continues for over six months. You know, because now the, our debt is sustainable, but it's very easy for that sustainability to be, to be uh, reversed. And again, it goes to the, the, the vulnerability of small island economies. Thank you for a very good question. Okay, I think there was another question here. Okay. If you could please stand and introduce yourself. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Evry Vicky from University of London. And I would like to ask, um, what is the development path you suggest given the very, very fragile ecosystem of small islands such as Tuvalu or Vanuatu or even Seychelles that may not be here in 100 years' time. Thank you. Thank you for a very good question. You're from University of London? The University of London is twinned with the University of Seychelles. You know this. Good. So you must come. Uh, the uh, the uh, question you've asked is very good. I think the first thing is that we have to, first of all, look at the environment as an economic resource, but an economic resource which you, you leverage it by preserving it. If we take the example of Seychelles, we are the country in the world that has the most territory, which is natural reserve. 47% of our land is dedicated as natural reserves. Okay, for countries like Tuvalu, Nui, uh, there is the question that they as, as uh, the climate cl change is progressing, they may not exist, and this is a huge problem. It's a huge problem for a humanitarian point of view. The battle against climate change is a battle, against, is a battle for small island states about existence. Unfortunately, their fate is a little bit not in their hands. There, there is a, a, a real problem, and many of these countries, they already have people a lot of people don't realize this. These smaller countries, a lot of the people are leaving those countries already, and they're going to settle elsewhere because they know what's going to happen. And this is a tragedy. It's a great loss for the, for the planet. But a lot that can be done, first of all, is if we can at least mobilize the funds that have been promised for climate change. There's over $7 billion promised for climate change. I think hardly any of it has been dispersed, or a very limited amount of it has actually been dispersed. Again, it doesn't actually halt the problem, but it can allow some adaptation strategies. Of course, small island states, we are calling for a binding agreement which 
asks for an increase of not more than 1.5 degrees. Cancun means that we are at 2 degrees, which does mean these islands will disappear. For me, it's not acceptable, but we are part of an international society. We, are, we put our points of view to, uh, forward. We are fighting also for them. Seychelles, because of the nature of our islands, we will still be livable, but the, the way of life changes. The way of life changes because climate change, it's sea level rise. It's also warming of the ocean, which means that corals are affected. Many of the coral reefs that also affect fish stocks. So if in 10 years' time the, the price of a can of tuna is 10 times more, it's also due to climate change. So a lot of people th think that it's only a small group of islands. It's the whole world. It's just a question of when it hits us. So we have always campaigned, say, no, we have to go for a binding 1.5 degrees increase target maximum. Uh, it is very difficult because industrialized countries are not currently recognizing that. In terms of the, the, the development path, it's a losing battle. I have to, I have to, I have to put it that way. Uh, but in terms of getting also tourism as a, a, a leverage, getting maximum number of people to come and see what's there now, and which also creates a sense that maybe we want to save it. There are, there are not many options available to them, but we certainly, as Seychelles, we are pushing for whatever we can in support of them in the international community. Maybe you should point out that uh, several of our islands are granitic yes. and rises to many, Hundreds three or four meters. thousand feet, and we are not there for threat and for extinction there. Yes. But the coral islands are like Vanuatu, etc. Yes. So that's where there yes. is a, a survival yes. on our side. <coughs> Sorry, I, I will apologize for my, street, my funny voice. I have a little bit of a, a cold. Uh, Sir James is correct. Seychelles is, is actually a unique archipelago. We have a mixture of granitic islands and coralline islands. So granitic islands are old, old rock created by volcanoes, but millions of years old. So our main islands have lush forests and they are mountainous. The highest peak is 903 meters, so which is relatively high uh, for most island states. So, and most people actually live on these bigger granitic islands. So as Sir James said, we will not have the same problem of population displacement that many of the Pacific islands do. But we also have granitic atolls. And these are great biodiversity uh, treasures. And these, in, even in Seychelles, may be lost. So, while our people are less at risk, we view, we view it, development has to be looked at from a, a global perspective. I've mentioned we have all these categories and so on. Are we really achieving development or are we just solving small little problems, troubleshooting? We need to look at development from a more global perspective and that includes from, for climate change. Another question here. Uh, thank you, my name is Yoj Fad Ben Israel. Pro, uh, Project Director, CDA. First, I'd like to thank you for just trying to tackle the brief of a foreign minister in Seychelles and Sid. And I know we've had stories like this within this presentation, especially from Rwanda and others. So I'm not going to take it from the perspective of the glass is half empty, the glass is half, half full. full. But you did make some viable statements, and I just want to Knowing that you'll be in the office with goodwill, I won't say touch with goodwill, extended, you're going to have to face these challenges. Uh, just this morning, over in Japan, they had the 8.9 Richter scale with the aftershocks, which means within three days, 72 hours, added to Christchurch. As against global um, warming, we do have the reality of a tsunami coming over, and where Seychelles is, it's very vulnerable within that fragile state. We have the aftershocks also just this morning of the Spanish situation again with the euro, which again begins to change. You're talking about those models. And finally, if I can say, not even talking about the diaspora, you did talk about the way your projections were in terms of if you can maintain the 1.5 degree but they're already predicting the six degree phenomena in turn because I wanted to ask the VW individual, 
something, and I'm just saying all these things are concurrent. This morning, VW was predicted to overtake Toyota and virtually in 2018 produce more cars. So what he was talking about corporate cannot stand in terms of that. How do you as an island, in your sincerity of development and trying to take things which you may not be able against these shocks to replicate, make sure that your identity does not go down in terms of when the benefactors or the guarantors come to ask their money against these odds, how would you be able to create to rise up against that challenge? Thank you. Thank you very much for a very good question. Um, I, and I will start by saying the glass is, glass is half full because you always have to... Uh, uh, when I was at university, there was a very interesting uh, author called Robert Cox, and he always said what we need is uh, pessimism in our analysis but optimism in our will. And I think that's a very important thing that we have to have. We have to be very critical when we look at what's going on. We have to be very critical because by being critical, we will try and get things the best that we can. But then we have to believe that we can make things happen, and that's very important. So then all of those challenges you've mentioned, uh, I was on the border of getting depressed. But then that's why I started with the statement of saying the glass is, is half full. There are so many challenges in the world today. I think the key thing is to say again, these challenges, we can, islands are the barometers. We will be hit first. We, we feel the oil price more than anybody else because a big country, if you, when you're buying one million tons of, of, of oil, you can spread, you can amortize that cost. When a small island buys oil, the cost can increase much, much more relatively. When you're buying one liter at the pump, the increased jump seems much bigger because the country had to import a smaller amount in the first place. So the cost per liter is always more. So there's always these things in terms of how the islands are hit by these impacts, by climate change as well. The cost of adaptation to climate change is higher per person in a small economy than it is for a, a, a larger economy. But the thing is, it will always catch up with us eventually. We have to think in those terms. We have to think that in the world, yes, let's say in Europe, we're not going to notice the rising of the seas of the next 10 years. But we have to think about our children that are not going to be able to buy fish because the fish is not going to be available because the, the waters in which they are, they are living are not allowing them to spawn in the same way. We have to think of the future very much in terms of how we look at the, uh, uh, the development perspectives. I think in terms of industry, in terms of the private sector, we also need to start looking at real solutions that don't just mean Let's take money and, and spend it, and we don't get a return. Climate change, renewable energy, renewable energy can transform the way the world makes money. Okay, a country like, like Seychelles, we are trying to get all of the hotels to use renewable energy in terms of generation of their, of their, of their, uh, um, uh, the generation of their energy. But this is great for their brand. Hotels, I think any of you, if you are thinking of going, to, going somewhere, if a hotel tells you, I'm running my hotel on sustainable energy, you automatically will feel that that hotel is offering you a better, a better package. Plus, the real cost for that hotel over the long term will actually be less because they've adapted uh, renewable energy. But the problem is, is that so many of uh, the, the investment possibilities are defined by companies that are still looking at oil-based uh, technologies as the basis for growth, whereas renewable technologies can really transform the perspectives for growth, for growth in Africa particularly, because we need to jump in development in Africa. We cannot just walk baby steps. What we're doing at the moment is still baby steps. It's trickle-down development. We need transformative development, and renewable energy is one of those areas. It's not this, there's, no, there's no solution. There's no magic solution. But if you have renewable energy and you have funds that are invested in, in renewable energy, you can have these big jumps in development, which will allow low-cost uh, energy. But the big problem is the startup cost. Again, you get how do you get this started? That's where the problems are. Allow me to maybe ask a, a final question, if I may. Uh, I think There's one at the, ah, at the right, back. So then uh, I'll ask the, the final, final question. If, if we have time. Say, okay. I mean, yeah, sure. sure. Where, whereabouts? I didn't see the hand. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Orla, I'm from Ireland, and I'm doing an internship at the ICD. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about 
the effect of um, the tragic incident of Michaela McAreevy from Northern Ireland. Um, I know it was a very isolated and tragic incident, but I do know that the effect it had was that many tour companies from Ireland and the United Kingdom suspended um, some of their some of their plans for uh, tours to the Seychelles uh, this summer. Um, so I, I was wondering the, fe the effect that that had on the wow. tourism industry and what it might have for the next few wow. months, in your opinion. It's in Mauritius. It's in Mauritius. <laughs> yeah. Actually, for the moment, we've actually benefited from it because it happened in Mauritius. So a number of people <laughs> that were going to Mauritius are coming to Seychelles. But uh, the, the risk, this is, this is a, it is a very good question because it is linked to the question of a brand. Safety is key, is key to how brands are projected. So, and in fact, we, we talk a lot about our brand also jointly with Mauritius, which is why you, you saw this in the same way, because we market the Indian Ocean. We market Seychelles, Mauritius, Réunion, Eastern Africa. So there is this perception sometimes that that happened in Mauritius, or it can happen in Seychelles as well, even though it was, it's a different country. So I can see very much where the, the, the problem ar 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 arises. So we have a little temporary uh, leeway, but we do need to be working on, on brands which are resistant. And this is why I've been talking in my presentation, also I'm the foreign minister, because, so I can't say just tourism, but we have to have an image of Seychelles which is beyond tourism. We have to have an image of Seychelles because there are lots of things that we're doing and we're doing well and people don't know about us because we just hear about the beaches. So I've had these pictures here because I, I want you to see how beautiful my country is. But I also want you to know that my country is much more than this. So, and this is one of the messages I've tried to put in, the, in the, the remarks I've made, because also the opportunities that we have, if we're going to develop, we have to think beyond just the tourism of sun, sea, and sand. There's a culture to be, to be discovered. There's the environmental aspect, the sustainable aspect. And even in terms of the uh, projects that we're doing to empower, for example, women and young people, I mean, I, I'm not the youngest minister in the world, but I'm one of the youngest. And I think the future of uh, development means that also having this uh, mix of, of different age groups, of different people of different cultures, and I think this is also what the ICD is doing very well to promote, is sharing of views among people from different backgrounds and bringing everybody together, which can allow us to have uh, better ideas for the way forward. I've spoken much too much, so thank you very much for your... Uh, Actually, if I may, before we applaud, a quick question, a quick question, just following up on that, uh, just from the point of view of cultural diplomacy, I think nation branding to a large degree is about also breaking stereotypes, informing, uh, so in some ways shaping also the perception and the presentation of countries abroad. Absolutely. We know the Seychelles is beautiful, uh, we don't need to discuss that, uh, but there are so many aspects of the Seychelles that I think many don't know about, as you were just saying, in terms of the young politicians, for example, there, I think you were saying 50% of the ministers also in the Seychelles are under the age of 50. Uh, you're a great example yourself, I think the youngest foreign minister the Seychelles ever had. Uh, if you look at issues like sustainability, as you were saying, the vast majority of citizens in the Seychelles ride bikes, not cars. I think it's actually, you need to get special permission to actually have a car. Oh, that's on one island. It's one one of island. the islands. Yeah, but, one but just as an example, I think there's a lot of innovation there. So my question is, what role do you think cultural diplomacy could have in helping to shape, uh, let's say, the perception of the Seychelles abroad, uh, so that also we might actually know about some of these less known facts, aside from just this beautiful country, the sort of innovative Seychelles that we've learned a little bit about today. What role can cultural diplomacy play in that? I think, I think cultural diplomacy is essential because we do need to look beyond the, the stereotypes. And cultural diplomacy automatically means understanding a little bit where a culture is coming from, how a culture came about. And the, the beauty of, of, of our islands is not only the, the beautiful scenery, it's also the, the way our society came about. And I'll give you a quick, quick history. That Seychelles was uninhabited as islands. The, the only inhabitants were giant tortoises. That was it. It was uh, uh, for many years uninhabited. It was colonized by the French in the 1770s that brought African slaves. Now, right from the start, because of the isolation of the islands, there was a mixing. There was a very much a, a mixing between the colonizers and, and the slaves. And then you had Indian traders that came and Chinese traders that came. And we are now truly a melting pot of cultures in Seychelles. And we, we see that as, a, as one of the great advantages, that in Seychelles we can talk of uh, harmony among the races. In fact. In Seychelles, we don't talk about racism because uh, everybody um, comes from uh, a history where there, there is so much mixing among the populations that 
we, we don't talk about whether your background of, is European or whether your background is, is uh, um, African or whether it's Asian and so on. Because the reality is if you actually go to the, the records in the archives, you'll find, well, no, there's a bit of everything in everybody. And that's the big, big advantage. And this is one of the things that means that our, our islands, in terms of the way, have we lost the mic? So in terms of the way we market our islands, it's about looking beyond the surface. And it's about understanding a lot of things that makes those islands special. In terms of the young uh, political uh, uh, leadership, it, it is very much in that there has been a dynamism. There has been a need to, to change and to, to, to uh, move the country forward. And to do that, you've had to have new ideas. So there's been a constant movement in terms of political leadership. Who does that political leadership and, and, and so on? So President Mankam started a journey in 76 when, we, when we, we went for independence. And now the political class is complete, a completely different political class. We thank him for his contribution, but we have moved. You know, there is this constant need for, for movement and for, for change in a positive way. So these are all things about how different societies can also learn from each other. Because there's no society that's perfect. We also have our own problems. Uh, in Seychelles, plenty of them. I'm not going to tell you about them, but there are, we have plenty of problems. I've told you enough about the developmental uh, challenges. So I think I would like to end by saying it is a place definitely worth discovering. And when you do come, if any of you can come, uh, you can visit our university. There's a lot to see in terms of what the society is like, what makes up the society. And it's not just uh, the beauty of the islands. There's much more to it than that opportunity to express my gratitude to you. It's really a special honor to have a current foreign minister to be with us for actually a period of a few days this week. I've benefited a lot from our uh, private conversations as well as the informal discussions during the coffee breaks, as well as, of course, from your excellent lecture. I think it was really wonderful for us to have Seychelles represented and a very, very high honor for us that you yourself took your time to be here with us today to come into dialogue with us. So if you could please join me in a very, very uh, huge thank you, the Honorable John Paul Adam. Thank you. Thank you very much.